ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. You get a call that a downtown hotel has been held up by a bandit who carries a sawed-off shotgun. Your job? Find him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Sunday, October 9th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith, the boss, chief of detectives, Thad Brown. My name's Friday. We are on our way out from the office, and it was 2.06 a.m. when we got to the corner of Cinnabar Street and Grand Avenue, the Brinton Hotel. Well, I, I just done what he told me. I figured there was no point in getting myself all roiled up. Didn't see where that would be helping matters. Yes, sir. Whatever he said, I done it. Hey, you fellas looking for a room? Police officers, this is Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Are you from Robbery? That's right. Uh, Roberts, 1F16. Mm -hmm. You answered the call? Yeah. The description's out. Metro's sending a couple of cars to help us look for the suspect. All right, good. Anything else I can do for you? No, not right now. Okay. I'll take care of the report. Thank you. We'll check with you. Right. You know, I sure would have been wrong about you two. What's that? I never would have guessed you was cops. Oh. Salesmen. That's what I'd put you boys down for. I see. Ladies ready to wear. Guess I would have missed the boat this time. Yes, sir. Would you tell us about the holdup, please? I thought them other officers already let you in on it. Well, we'd like to get the details from you if we could. Oh, oh. Well, I ain't got nothing better to do. Stuck here till 7 a.m., anyhow. I wonder if we could have your name. Boxer. Tom Boxer. That's B-O-X-E-R? That's it, you know, just like a dog. Uh -huh. What time did the robbery take place? Oh, 40, 45 minutes ago, along around 1.20, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Wasn't 1.30 yet, I'm sure of that. Oh? You see, I was listening to the radio, Stan Swift. <clears throat> Who's that? You know Stan Swift. He's on every night, midnight till 6, seven nights a week. Oh, yeah. The nights go swifter with Swift. <laughs> That's how he puts it. Uh -huh. Gives a time signal every hour and every half hour. Remember him giving the 1 a.m.? Hadn't given the 130 yet, so it must have been around uh, 120 when this fella come into the hotel. What'd he do? Walked up to the desk. Yes, sir. I didn't even know he was there. Well, not at first. Mm -hmm. I was sitting down in that chair, kind of had my back away from the door. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> didn't hear him neither on account of being plugged in. What was that? To my radio. Oh, I see. This year gadget, see? See? Mm -hmm. It's into your ear, like, like so. Yeah, mm -hmm. I understand. Let you listen without waking nobody up. Other end attaches to the set, like, like so. Mm-hmm. You mean that's a radio? <laughs> sure is. You ain't never seen this kind before, huh? No, sir. Transistor. Oh. That's what they call it. Regency transistor. Ain't got no tubes. That's what makes it so small, you see? Carry it around in your pocket, if you have a mind to. I see. Real good tone, though. Plenty of volume if you want to let it out. Yes, sir. Now, if you just tell us about the robbery, would you, Mr. Boxer, please? Well, ain't that what I've been doing? Yes, sir. You said this man walked up to the desk? That is right. Maybe stood there a couple of seconds before I sensed him. Mm -hmm. Unplugged myself, got up and asked him if he wanted a room. He said he did, uh, single. Yes, sir. Checked the boxes to see what was vacant. Had my back to him while I was checking. Didn't notice him opening up his satchel. Mm -hmm. Must have been carrying the gun there in the satchel. Anyway, when I turned around to register him, I found myself staring into the barrel. Shotgun it was. All right, go ahead, please. This is a stick-up, he said. Do what I tell you and you won't get hurt. I didn't know whether he meant business or not, and I sure didn't aim to test him to find out. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, I said, you just tell me what you want and I'll do it. Yeah. I ain't no coward, you understand, but I ain't no hero neither, especially when I'm facing up to a shotgun. Sure. Like the man says, only real heroes a dead hero. Yes, sir. Me, I just as soon go on living. That's why I done exactly what he told me. Give him the money from the cash drawer here. See? Every penny. Hand it all over to him. Didn't try to hold none back. Yes, sir. How much was there? Fifty, sixty dollars, somewhere in between there. Mm -hmm. What happened then? Well, he told me to empty my pockets, lay the stuff on the desk. 
You did, huh? I emptied them. I didn't have more than three or four dollars in change. He scooped it up with the other money, shoved it into his satchel. I see. Then he said for me to come out from behind this desk, walked me over to the elevator, told me to get inside and ride up to the top floor. That'd be the third. You see, the hotel's three stories high. Yes, sir, I understand. I suppose I could have got off on number two. He would have known the difference. Floor indicator down there don't work. Mm -hmm. But uh, I didn't see where I'd be gaining anything by it, so I'd done what he told me. I rode up to three. How long did you wait there? Oh, till I seen him leave the hotel. Mm -hmm. From the window end of the third floor hall. Did he drive away? No, nope, just strolled off. I don't think he had a car. I see. Turned the corner, and that was the last of him. Mm -hmm. And what did you do then? Took the elevator back down, called the police, listened to the radio while I was waiting. Yes, sir. Figured I might as well take it easy till the cops come. Wasn't more than five minutes before them officers walked in. A little while later, you fellas walked in. I guess you know when that was. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Boxer, could you tell us what he looked like? Huh? The man who held you. Oh, well, I told them other fellas, the ones wearing uniforms, they said they'd send out his description. Yes, sir, we understand. We'd like to have it, too. Okay. Oh, young fella, 25 to 30, I judge. No. Big bill, a little bigger than you. Mm. Not as big as you, though. Uh, somewhere in between. Yes, sir. Black hair. Didn't catch the color of his eyes. Well, that's about all. How was he dressed? Oh, suit. Stripe in it, I think. Maybe dark blue with a gray stripe. Bow tie. Kind of dapper. Mm-hmm. Have any scars? <laughs> Not where you'd notice them. You said he carried the gun in a satchel, is that right? Must have been where he had it. Didn't actually see him take it out, though. A back was to him at the time. How big was the satchel? Oh, medium-sized, about oh, so long. Any initials on it? No, not so far as I can recall. What about the gun? How big was it? This long, maybe. Mm -hmm. Single barrel, sawed off. Could you tell the make? Well, I ain't no expert on shotguns. No. Would you know this man if you saw him again? <laughs> sure, I'd be a fool not to. Why? I'd like to have you come down to the city hall in the morning, Mr. Boxer, if you would. But what for? I want to show you some photographs, see if we can pick them out. You mean this morning? Yes, sir, if you would. It's Sunday. Yes, sir, that's right. You fellas work on Sunday? Well, we're not the only one. Well, what do you mean? He did. Frank and I checked with the patrol officers who had answered Mr. Boxer's call. They told us that a search of the immediate vicinity had failed to turn up anyone who answered the suspect's description. 3.16 a.m., the crew from the crime lab finished up their investigation. There were no useful fingerprints or other physical evidence in the lobby of the hotel. 7.38 a.m., we checked the suspect's M.O. and the description with the stats office. They came up with 18 possibles. We pulled the packages from R&I and took them back to the office. Well, looks like it might rain. Pretty early in the season, isn't it? Well, the paper says we're going to have a wet winter. All right. Real good for skiing, I guess. Yeah. That's what you need. Lots of moisture. Heavy snow. You never go skiing. No. Well. No, I thought about taking it up a couple of years ago. Faye blew her stack, though. Mm. Said I'd probably break my neck first time I tried. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think she worries more about me than she does about the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, gents. Oh, hi, sir. Hope I haven't kept you waiting. No, sir, not a bit. How are you today, Mr. Boxer? Oh, sleepy. Usually get a couple of hours catnap during my shift. <clears throat> kind of missed out on it last night. Yes, sir, I'm afraid you did. Even after all you fellows left, somehow I just couldn't doze off. Listen to Stan Swift till 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. I'll bet you I know more about Egypt than a real live Egyptian. Well, you got them pictures you wanted to show me? Yes, sir, right over here. It's all right if I sit out? Yeah, go right ahead. <sighs> here you are. This the pile? Yes, sir, take your time. Look at each one as long as you like. Okay. Hey, pretty tough bunch of boys. Yeah. No, it's not him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Nope. Well, hey, wait a minute. There is a resemblance. He looks something like this one here. Is it the same man, Mr. Boxer? Oh, no, 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 not the same. Yeah. Similar type, though. Does that help you any? Might. You want to go through the others? Sure, sure. Now, you see this fellow? Yes, sir. He's not the same type at all. No. The other one I pointed out was, you You can see the difference yourself. Yes, sir. No. Ah, not him. Not him either. Nope. Oh, now, oh, this is closer to him. Sir? Not as close as that one, the other one, but, but closer. Yes, sir. 
Now we're getting further away. No, no, it's none of these. Is that all you got? Afraid so. Well, it's the best I can do for you. Uh, now, this one here, the one I pointed out first. Yeah, we understand, but it's not the same man, you see. Well, I never said it was. Just said they were similar. Yes, sir. Well, I'm sorry we wasted your time. Oh, it was no waste of time, not as far as I'm concerned. Huh? Remember my telling you about how I try to guess what different folks do for a living? Yeah. Looking at all these pictures will be a big help from now on. How's that? I'll know a crook when I see one. On the following Sunday, October 16th, two more hotels were held up by a shotgun bandit. Both robberies occurred during the early morning hours. Both hotels were small. The description of the suspect and his M.O. indicated that he was the same man who had robbed the Brinton Hotel. Frank and I continued our investigation, but we failed to turn up any leads. During the next week, all hotels in the downtown area were alerted. Sunday, October 23rd, the night manager of the Schaefer Arms near the corner of Broadway and Clay reported that he had been robbed at approximately 3.30 a.m. He confirmed the bandit's description and M.O., but was unable to add anything new. The next morning, October 24th, we had a conference with Chief Brown. Doesn't sound to me like you're any closer to him than we were two weeks ago. What do you got? Well, not much. Let's have it. Description? Pretty general, isn't it? Afraid so. What else? Well, now he's only worked one area. Yeah? All the hotels are within a mile of Pershing Square. Nothing to keep him from spreading out, is there? So far, he hasn't used a car. You figure he pulled these jobs on foot? Looks that way. Then he must live downtown somewhere. Mm Mm-hmm. Anything about the hotels that might give us a tip-off on his next move? Yeah, they're all small, only one person on duty. Uh Uh-huh. We've marked all the possibles here in the map. You want to take a look at it? Yeah. Okay, right here. These are the ones he's already hit. Here, here, over here. Tight little group? Yeah. These circles indicate all the other hotels of a similar nature in the downtown area. Uh Uh-huh. Well, he works on Sundays, huh? That's right. What do you got planned for this Sunday? Well, we'll stake out as many as we can. We've asked Metro to give us a hand. We figure we'll have enough men to cover about, oh, 20 likelies, maybe. We plan to run the stakes from midnight till 6 a.m. When he hits, it's usually between 2 and 4. How's that sound to you? About all we can do. Yeah. I want you both stay on this between now and Sunday, see if you can't pick up a lead somewhere. We will. Informant's been able to give you anything? Nope. They holding out? No, I don't think so. I don't think they know who he is. Well, maybe the stakes will work. Maybe. Wait a minute. Let me see that map again. Right here. Funny. See here? Yeah. You said these are the places he's already robbed? That's right. All right together. Draw a line from one to the other and you'd have a square. Yeah. What's this right in the middle of the square? That's the Argus Hotel on South Broadway. That's one he hasn't hit yet. Mm Mm-hmm. Looks like your best bet, then. Yeah, that's the way we figured it. Who's going to cover it Sunday? Well, Smith and I thought we'd take it. That's a coincidence. Hmm? Just who I was going to suggest. During the rest of the week, we continued our investigation, but we failed to turn up any additional information about the suspect. A few minutes before midnight on Saturday, October 29th, men from Metro and Robbery Division staked out 22 locations in the downtown area. Sunday, October 30th, 12.05 a.m., Frank and I entered the lobby of the Argus Hotel and we walked up to the desk. Sorry, we're full up. I'd like to talk to the manager if we can. I said we're full up. We're police officers. Huh? This is Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Oh. Could we see the manager? I'm the manager. You own this hotel? Me and my husband. Or maybe we'd better talk to him. Go ahead. If you can find him. Isn't he here? Nope. Would you know where he is? Nope. Not getting drunk, probably. I see. I work nights. He works days. He don't tell me where he goes at night. I don't tell him what I do during the day. That's our arrangement. Mm-hmm. It don't make for a real happy marriage, but it keeps us from killing each other. Yes, ma'am. Is there somebody who could take over for you here tonight? Nope. Now, you're sure your husband didn't say where he was going? We don't talk. Oh. He wants me to know something. He writes me a note, leaves it on the desk, and I do the same for him. I see. We ain't exchanged no words for the last two years. Uh-huh. Saves a lot of wear and tear on the nervous system. He never said nothing worth listening to anyway. I see. Well, what do you fellas want? Well, ma'am, several hotels have been held up downtown lately. No. You were warned about it, weren't you? George was warned, left me a note. I see. Well, there's a chance he might come here tonight. If he does, I'm ready for him. Hmm? Got me a gun. Pistol. Keep in the cash drawer, see? Yes, ma'am. I know how to use it, too. He shows up, I'm ready for him. Is there some place we could wait in case he does? You don't have to. I don't need no protection. Told you. I've got a gun. Yes, ma'am. So's he. (laughs) 
Mrs. Argus finally agreed to let us stake out the hotel. She showed us into a small room off the lobby. From there, Frank and I could see anybody who entered. During the next four hours, only two people requested accommodations. They were both middle-aged men, and neither one of them in any way resembled the suspect's description. What time you got, Joe? Oh, see, five after four. Huh? Latest they ever pulled a job was 3.30. Yeah. Maybe you decided to lay off tonight. Maybe. Argus Hotel. Huh? Who? Oh, oh, yeah. Hey, you guys in there? Yes, ma'am. Somebody wants you on the phone. Okay, I'll be right over. In the booth. Yes, ma'am. Friday. No, wait a minute. Okay, what's that address? Yeah, I got it, thanks. Right. What's that? Looks like we staked out the wrong places. Yeah. All night cafe on South Main. The owner was held up. He's pretty badly wounded. Yeah. Sawed off shotgun. Frank and I drove over to the Joplin Grill at the corner of Main and Vincent Place. We talked to the patrol car officers who had discovered Fred Joplin's body. They told us Joplin was unconscious when they found him. They said that they'd call an ambulance and that he'd been taken to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. We telephoned the hospital and asked them to be notified as soon as the victim was available for questioning. 4.42 a.m., Lieutenant Lee Jones and the crew from the crime lab began their investigation. Frank and I went back to the office. October 30th, 10.17 a.m., Georgia Street reported that Joplin had recovered consciousness. We drove down there and talked to Dr. Sebastian. He said that Joplin was suffering from shock and loss of blood. He also said that Joplin's right shoulder was severely lacerated and that there was a possibility the arm would have to be amputated. 10.46 a.m., we interviewed the victim. Sat down on the stool and asked for a cup of coffee. Yes, sir. I turned around, picked up the Silex, started filling the cup. Uh-huh. time I was finished, he'd got his gun out. Guess he had it in that bag he's carrying. Yes, sir. He told me it was a stick-up. Said to give him the money from the register or he'd shoot me. Mm-hmm. I didn't say nothing. Just stood there, kind of staring at him. Yeah. He raised up his gun. Shotgun, it was. Yes, sir. I mean business, mister. That's what he said next. I mean business. I see. I still didn't say nothing. Just stood there with a cup of coffee in my hand. Start moving, he said. Voice sounded real low and mean. Didn't seem to match his face. Sort of a pleasant-looking fella. Voice was mean, though. Yeah. Started gesturing with that shotgun. Pointing toward the register. That's when I let fly. Hmm? With a cup of coffee. Smashed it right into his face. I see. Must have given him quite a jolt. Yes, sir. Didn't keep him from shooting me, but it sure wrecked his aim some. Leastways, I'm still here. Don't remember nothing after that. I see. Sure, he'd him a good one, though. Them coffee cups ain't the lightest things in the world. Yes, sir, I understand. Not to mention the coffee itself. Scalding hot it was. Mm-hmm. Right here. That's where I belted him. Right in the jaw. Used to be a ball player, you know. Is that right? Wasn't a pro exactly, but I had a first-rate pitching arm. Lefty Joplin, that's what they used to call me. Back in Junction City, Kansas, it was. Mm-hmm. Local merchants sponsored our team. Pitched 16 winners one season. Best record in the league. Yes, that's very good. Well, I ain't lost all my technique. Leastways, I sure whacked him with that cup. Yes, sir. Uh, Doc say anything to you fellas about how I'm doing? Well, just that you're getting along. He make up his mind about my right arm yet? What? Whether I'm going to lose it or not? No, sir, he didn't tell us. Uh, guess in a way, I'm kind of lucky. What? Being left-handed. We asked the victim, Fred Joplin, to describe the suspect. The description he gave us tallied with what we already had. 11.17 a.m., Frank and I went back to the office. I can't figure it out, Joe. What? Why he'd switch from hotels to a cafe. Well, maybe he tumbled to our stakeouts. Yeah, I thought sure he'd try the Argus, though. It's the right spot for him. I get it. Robbery Friday. I see. Now, yeah. anything else? Mm-hmm. Well, it'll give us something to go on, anyway. Thank you. Right. Lee Jones in the lab. What's he got? Well, Joplin was right. He sure didn't miss with that coffee cup. They find the pieces? More than that. Huh? Found a broken front tooth. Analysis of the broken tooth revealed that it was part of a lower incisor. From what we learned of the suspect, it seemed likely that he would make an immediate effort to have the tooth replaced. For the next three days, Frank and I interviewed dentists in the immediate vicinity of the robberies. Thursday, November 3rd, 3.17 p.m. We questioned Dr. Clinton Potterfield in his office on the second floor of the Marsh Building. Yes, yes, I believe I had such a patient last Monday. Broken incisor? Yes, that's right. Could you tell us what he looked like? Oh, young man, about 30, nicely dressed, seemed very pleasant. 
Did he say what had happened to his tooth? Yes, he did. Automobile accident. I see. He knocked it against the steering wheel. Uh -huh. He wanted a new fitting right away. Yes, sir. He agreed to make him a temporary as soon as I could. It should be finished tomorrow. Mm -hmm. He offered to pay me extra if I'd hurry it up. I told him you can't rush a new bridge, even a temporary. Yes, sir. Did he give you his name and address? Well, not me personally. My receptionist takes care of those details. Yes, I understand. Would you mind checking with her? No, not a bit. Excuse me. It's about time we got a break. Oh. Hey, look out there. Hmm? It's starting to rain. Yes, sir, it is. Yeah, just like the paper said. It's going to be a wet winter. Ah, yeah. uh, here you are, gentlemen. I had her copy down for you. Thank you. Philip Siever. Huh? Yes, that's correct. His address is right there, too. Yeah. Well, at least we know one thing now. What's that? Why he skipped over the Argus Hotel. Yeah? He lives there. Three fifty-eight p.m. Frank and I drove over to the Argus Hotel and we talked to the owner, George Argus. He told us that Philip Seaver lived on the second floor, room twenty-three. He said that Seaver was a quiet young man who had been staying at the hotel for the past six weeks. He also told us that Seaver worked nights and was probably in his room now. We took the elevator up to the second floor. There it is. All right. Hey, what's happening against there. the Waller? What? Move! I sure don't know what this is all about. No, he's clean, Joe. All right, turn around. Okay. Where's the shotgun? You guys must be off your rockers. I'll see what I can turn up. All right. You got no right to come busting in here. Yeah. Now, what would I be doing with the shotgun? Why don't you tell us? I never had a gun in my life. Boy, you cops sure make the darnest mistakes. I bet you picked the wrong guy up half the time. Yeah, sure. Look, there's nothing in that bureau except my clothes there, fella. Yeah, what about this? Well, it's just a satchel, that's all. It's locked. Where's the key? I don't know. I lost it. Break it open. Yeah. Hey, that's a good bag. It's not worth anything to you without a key, is it? All right, Seaver, let's go. How the heck did that get in there? You don't know. I told you I didn't. Yeah. I never had a shotgun in my life. Well, you got one now. Oh, I must have picked up the wrong bag by mistake. Sure, that's what happened. All right, come on, Seaver. Okay, okay, I'm coming. Get I... down! I... No! No! Cut your hand? Uh, be all right. Look at that. Huh? You must have bad ones. What's that? Another tooth missing. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 12th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. <laughs> Philip Herbert Seaver was tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree, five counts, and received sentence as prescribed by law. Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment for a period of not less than five years in the state penitentiary. Because of the viciousness of the suspect, it was decided that the terms would run consecutively. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. <laughs>